Go ahead and turn with me to the book of Genesis uh, chapter number 16. For those of you that may be visiting you here, or f- maybe here visiting for the first time or haven't been here in a bit, we're going through a series in our church called Family Matters. We kicked off, launched this series back in February with a focus on marriage, looking at how the Bible laid the foundation or the design for us in uh, the book of Genesis with that first marriage between Adam and Eve. And we then begin to look at some New Testament principles where we were able to focus on how in the letter to the Ephesians, Paul is very explicit on how we're able to apply um, some principles and some truths out of God's word that help uh, govern and help us really grasp and embrace those roles that God has defined in marriage, the husband and wife marriage in particular. And we went through that series for about uh, five or six weeks, and we then began to look at some parenting stuff a few weeks ago. And uh, if you remember from that part of our study, we referred to it as practical parenting, and we looked at what it means or how it is as parents we can help um, even as grandparents, I mean, as a matter of fact, in a couple of weeks, we're going to talk about how it means to parent as grandparents. Uh, but uh, we're going to look at um, some very practical things. And uh, a few weeks ago, we were looking at parenting small children and how to love was the title of that sermon, how to love our little lambs. And I think last time we were together because we took a two week break as we spent time with that group from New Philadelphia and Kansas and Iola, Kansas, one had a great time, that Nambe team that God put together to minister to the, the Pueblo kids. Uh, what a blessing they were. And then last week, we had the Lord's Supper. So apologize for the little, uh, uh, the little lull here, the little gap between our series. But um, this month, we're going to be looking at some principles on parenting that are outside the scope of what we would consider a, um, a typical marriage or family situation where you have both a husband and wife. As you can tell from the title of our sermon this morning, it's we're going to be focusing on how to parent as a single parent, which is a very prevalent thing. But I want you guys to know, just like Solomon said in the book of Ecclesiastes chapter 3, there is no new thing under the sun. We're going all the way to Genesis this morning to look at a story where you find really the first single parent in the Bible. Just yesterday or a couple days ago as a church, we gathered together and made our ascent up Santa Fe Baldy uh, to kind of do our annual pilgrimage, if you will, to higher ground so that we could continue to focus on what it means to think and, and use that as a merit for to think spiritually. And one of the things that I like to observe and I'm mindful of and I even share with some of our folks as we're on that track is I point out where the sources of various rivers are. We were able to identify from looking at just a certain peak up there called Penitente, where the Nambe River starts. And it's from there that the Nambe flows all the way down into the Rio Grande in Powaki. And we see all these tributaries in these mountains. And oftentimes, we don't ever really stop and consider where the source of these rivers begin. And I want us to grasp and understand that in the book of Genesis, you find the source of any and every scenario and situation that you'll find in life, not just as it relates to marriage, but issues like we're dealing with or we're going to be considering today about what it means to parent as a single parent. It's not an easy thing anymore, as you'll see in the text, but how we respond for those of us that are in this room How we respond is we parent our children regardless of whatever age they are is really key and is really critical. And this morning we're going to look at some very practical things out of Genesis that are going to drive home these uh, these responses that we ought to have in this very somewhat unique but very prevalent role in parenting our kids as single parents In a couple of weeks, we're going to look at parenting in a blended family. And then in about three weeks, folks, we're going to look at what it means to parent as a grandparent. Any of those around? Where's uh, Jack and Sylvia, right? (laughs) In fact, they've got their little granddaughters for another week. 
So they get to parent as grandparents. And where's Charlie and Cindy? Congratulations. Brand new grandparents. How, how old is uh, um, Elijah Thomas? That's right. 14 days old. And who's counting? Um, but uh, got to meet little Elijah Thomas. Does he still have that full head of hair that I saw the other day? Man, what a, what a blessing. So I just so appreciate and love God's word because in it you find anything and everything that we need to really embrace and overcome, allow Jesus to be there with us as we overcome because the lamb has overcome. So as you go through life, regardless of your situation and circumstances, whether you're a, a grandparent raising your grandkids or you're a single parent or you're a blended family, everything that we need are found within the pages of this precious book of his holy word that we need to understand and grasp these various roles and responsibilities that we're having to live out in this life. So having said that, just as we were looking and traversing up some of those trails and a lot of my trip was with Michelle and with Marvin and we would look up to Penny Tent and we would say, hey, there's the headwaters to the Nambel Lake. This morning, we're gonna look at the headwaters of single parenting. In the book of Genesis chapter number 16. This chapter is a milestone chapter in God's word. And here's why. You find an interesting situation that plays out. With three key characters in our text. Three very fascinating folks. That show up in the text. As a result of what happens in this chapter, we are still dealing with some of the geopolitical issues to this day. In this chapter, you're going to find a young man being born out of God's plan. But God, in spite of the circumstances that this one particular lady found herself in, he's there present, encouraging and revealing to her what it means to be a victor instead of a victim in this life. Because there are a lot of folks in this world today, a lot of single parents, single moms, single dads even, that are sometimes overwhelmed with what this world is throwing at them because as you'll see even in this story, they felt and they experienced some abandonment. And it happens to this day. And what we're seeing and what we're witnessing in the Middle East today, and we've heard from the news recently that the current administration has already come up with another peace plan that they're pushing forward to try to bring some peace between the Jews and the Arabs in the Middle East. Well, guess where that battle began? Genesis chapter 16. But here is the cool thing about God. In this text, in this passage this morning, you see some promises that he makes to certain people in the passage. A particular individual, a woman, by the way, a single mom that is ultimately going to play out and we're even seeing it come to fruition as we speak, even geopolitically. We know from what we see and watch on the news that there's a lot of crazy stuff happening and there's a lot of hatred because of what played out here in Genesis chapter number 16. There's a unique place in the country of Israel, a city by the name of Hebron. Hebron is a fascinating place because that is the place or what is a city today where Abraham paid for a cave to bury his wife Sarah those two individuals show up in our story this morning. And what's interesting about that place today, you can't find or you can't see the cave, but there's this huge structure right smack in the middle of Hebron. And you know what that structure consists of? A synagogue on one side, and listen to this, and a mosque on the other. They share this same location, the Jews and the Arabs, relative to what transpired in this story. As much as they despise and hate each other to this day, you find a commonality because of this story 
as it relates to Abraham. That's why they're often referred to, even to this day, as the Abra- Abrahamic faith. Anybody ever hear that, those terms or that term? Where does the term or the concept of the Abrahamic faiths come from? Genesis chapter number 16. Abraham had two wives. One was the wife that God ordained specifically for him. Her name is Sarah. And she, for whatever reason, thought she had to figure God's plan out for 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 the promise that God made to Abraham and as a result because of that little contrived plan it causes some chaos and some consternation within the family as a result you're finding a situation where you find this other wife this other person in Abraham's life as being ostracized or abandoned But the charge and what we find in the Word of God today are the principles. If we live them out as we apply them regardless of our situation and trust the Lord through this process, we will be victorious. Why? Because the Lamb has already overcome. This is the beauty of how God orchestrates things and how He's put these things together for you and for me. So if you've got your Bibles, go ahead and turn with me to the book of Genesis chapter number 16. And before we dive into the chapter and begin to unpack some of these things, I want to just kind of give you a little bit of background. This whole thing begins to play out, this storyline in in terms of who and how God is orchestrating people, places, and events, um, really begins in Genesis chapter number 12. Genesis 12 is your, is your key milestone chapter where God really sets a marker in history as he calls out a man to create a nation that all nations in the world are going to be blessed through. In Genesis chapter 12, verse number 1, you find these words, Now the Lord had said unto Abram, this is the guy, his name has been shortened to Abram until you get to chapter number 17. Something significant happens in 17 where God changes his name. But until then, this is where you see the promise being made to this guy named Abram who ultimately becomes the father of the Jewish people. And also, believe it or not, the father of what we know today as the Arab peoples or the Islamic peoples. It says in verse number one, Now the Lord had said unto Abram, Get thee out of thy country and from thy kindred and from thy father's house unto a land that I will show thee. And I will make thee a great nation. There's the promise. And I will bless thee and make thy name great. And thou shalt be a blessing, and I will bless them that bless thee, and curse them that curseth thee, and in thee shall all families of the earth be blessed. Right there in those first three verses in Genesis chapter 12, God lays out this promise, this charge for this man Abraham. And if you go through and you read the rest of the chapter, something very interesting and, and very fascinating happens. They move from what is southern Turkey today, a place called Haran, into the promised land, what we know today as modern day Israel. And they're in Israel and they're starting to settle the land and, and, and embrace the promise that God made to them here in, this, in the first three verses of this chapter. And all of a sudden a famine happens. And just like most of God's people throughout history, every time that happened or a famine occurred, Where would they end up or where would they go typically? To Egypt. That's exactly where they find themselves in the story. So Abraham packs up his family. There's a famine in the land. They head down to Egypt. Everything's hunky-dory in in Egypt. The Pharaoh's in control. Everybody's being fed. Things are good to go. And Abraham looks at his wife, Sarah, and says, you know what, so that uh, this guy doesn't kill us because of who we are. Tell them 
or pretend that you are my sister and not my wife. So they show up in Egypt. You can read it in the rest of the chapter in, in verse number 16 or look at verse number 14 real quick. And it came to pass that when Abram was come into Egypt, the Egyptians beheld the woman, Sarah, that she was very fair, very beautiful woman. And all these Egyptian dudes were, be, were attracted to her. And it says in verse 15, and the princes also of Pharaoh saw her and commanded her before Pharaoh. And the woman was taken unto Pharaoh's house and he entreated Abraham. Well, for her sake, and he had sheep and oxen and he asses and men servants and catch this one and maid servants and she asses and camels and the Lord God plagued Pharaoh and his house with great plagues because of Sarah, Abraham's wife. And once you get through the rest of the chapter and the rest of the verses, you find that Pharaoh catches on to Abraham's deception over here and he says, you need to get out of my country. And this is where Genesis 16 picks up. Now turn over to Genesis chapter 16 and this is where we'll be hanging out this morning. So this morning we're going to look at three very key principles or truths in chapter number 16. We're going to see what happens in the life of a single mom and how she experienced man's abandonment in the story. And how this woman was encouraged when none other than Jesus shows up. And then the third principle we're going to consider is how she embraced this profound promise that God makes in her life and wait till we get to the end of the story because we are seeing it happen right before our eyes in this day and age. So let's look first at who this single mom is in her role knowing that as Abraham was before Pharaoh in Genesis chapter 12, he provided all this dowry stuff so that he can take Sarah for himself. And once that lie was revealed, they were sent packing. And in that lump sum of stuff, a certain individual shows up, a maidservant. A maidservant who shows up for the first time right here in this chapter by the name of Hagar. Look with me at the first six verses in our text. And now Sarai, Abraham's wife, bear him no children. So huge dilemma here, right? Why? Because of Genesis chapter 12. The Bible makes it very clear and also in chapter number 15 that it was going to be through Abraham's seed through his children that the nations of the world were to be blessed. But we have a situation where his wife Sarah is barren. She can't have children. So what do we do? Just like you and me when we don't when things don't quite come through quite like we would like them to come through or we adhere to certain things that God reveals to us and it's not happening in our time or in our way, what do we do? We start to get ahead of God. And that's exactly what Sarah does in the story. Look with me here in verse two. And Sarah, I'm sorry, and Sarah, Abraham's wife, bare no children. And she had a handmaid, an Egyptian, whose name was Hagar. And Sarah said unto Abram, Behold now, the Lord hath restrained me from bearing. I pray thee, go into my maid, that it may be that I may obtain children by her. And Abram hearkened to the voice of Sarah. So who came up with this little plan? Sarah. Honey, can't have kids. But I have these, this Egyptian handmaid that is very fertile. Go in under her, verse number three. 
And Sarah, Abraham's wife, took Hagar, her maid, the Egyptian, after Abram had dwelt 10 years in the land of Canaan and gave her to her husband, Abram, to be his what? To be his wife. Completely contrary to Hebraic values and principles. Obviously, we know that this is way before Old Testament law, which happens in the book of Exodus chapter number 20, when the lawgiver, when Moses is given the law by Almighty God himself on Mount Sinai. This is way prior to that, but they knew because of who they were that God's design was always one man and one woman, just like Adam and Eve. And she says, take her. Take this handmaid in mind, this servant girl, as your wife. It says in verse 4, And he went in unto Hagar, and she conceived. And when she saw that she had conceived, her mistress was despised in her eyes. And Sarai said unto Abraham, My wrong be unto thee. I have given my mind into thy bosom. And when she saw that she had conceived, I was despised in her eyes, and the Lord judged between me and thee. But Abram said unto Sarai, Behold, thy maid is in thy hand. Do to her as it pleaseth thee. And when Sarai dealt hardly with her, or harshly with her, she fled from her face. So what you find in this young Egyptian servant girl is an experience that is all about being abandoned and feeling abandoned in her life. Taken from a palace to a tent where she was in Egypt. Abandoned by Pharaoh who just kind of gave her up here. Take this woman, take all this stuff and just leave my country. And then you find... Sarah, after she conceives, after it was her idea for her to marry her husband, now she's upset and starts to deal with her, the Bible says, harshly or hardly. And now this woman who, thought, who she thought she had a relationship with, and mind you, they had to travel from Egypt all the way back to Canaan so that there was some kind of connection and some kind of a relationship, I'm sure, that was established on that journey. That same woman now is saying, Get out of my house. And then lastly, the father of her child is saying, get out. Talk about feeling and experiencing abandonment in her life. So Hagar was in no doubt emotionally affected by all that she was going through in this journey and we get to verse number seven eight nine you'll see why you'll see what she was going through she was desperate or she finds herself in an extremely desperate situation she's abandoned by anybody and everybody that was in her life and as you read this story and you consider all that is playing out, Hagar becomes nothing more than a pawn in other people's lives. Anybody been there? Still, still may be happening in some of your, your cases or in your life. But God in his intimate plan and in his sovereignty even had her in mind. As far as Hagar was concer concerned, she was never first in anyone's life, including the dude that fathered her child. She could just imagine how she felt. So not only was she emotionally abandoned, an emotionally abandoned soul, she was also spiritually wounded by those that I believe knew better. And who was that? Abraham and Sarah, they were followers of God. They knew the ways of God. From chapter number 12, when God first reveals himself to Abraham and begins to lay out his plan and his purpose for him, these folks knew better. And instead of 
helping her and walking her through her despair and her abandonment, what do they do? They kick her out. They condemn her. So right off the bat, Hagar is in a huge dilemma and a big predicament. Everything that she had learned about God or anything that she knew about God, she learned from Abraham and Sarah. And now the only people in her life that taught her about God have now turned on her. It's like, what do I do? Where do I go? I love the words of the Apostle Paul as he's writing to the Ephesians in chapter number four as he prepares to reveal the importance of marriage and relationships. He talks and he uses these words. He says in verse number 31, let all bitterness and wrath and anger and clamor and evil speaking be put away from you with all malice. And he says, be ye kind one to another, tenderhearted, forgiving one another, even as God for Christ's sake hath forgiven you. Old Abraham and Sarah weren't being very Christ-like, were they? Not at all. What a picture, what an example of how the church tends to be in some cases in the lives of certain people where we let bitterness because of a situation or a circumstance in our lives just hinder or limit or really destroy the life of somebody else because of our testimony or lack of testimony. That is why the New Testament is so profound and so key and so critical in our lives because it brings a whole other light to the issues that we deal with even to this day. Now let me share with you in verses 7 through 9 some interesting things that began to play out in her life now that she's been abandoned by the only people that knew and had invested anything about God in her life. It says this in verse number seven, and the angel of the Lord, mark that folks, principle number six for you Wednesday night Bible study students, this is principle number six of the principles of Bible study, the law of first mention. This is the first time the phrase angel of the Lord shows up in scripture. And isn't it interesting that it shows up within the context of God dealing with this, this lost woman, this Egyptian handmaiden. And it says in verse number seven, and the angel of the Lord found her by a fountain in the wilderness, by the fountain in the way to sure. Isn't that cool? Anybody know who this angel of the Lord is? Anybody have any clue, any ideas? You know who it is? It's the pre-incarnate Christ. Jesus shows up in the life of this woman. How do you know it's Jesus? Look down at verse number 13. Verse 13. And she called the name of the Lord that spake unto her, Thou God seest me. Isn't that cool? You know exactly who she's talking to, who's dealing with her. The angel of the Lord. Anytime that phrase shows up in the Old Testament, it's, a, it's Jesus Christ in his pre-incarnate form. And here he shows up for the first time in the, as the angel of the Lord and he shows up to this Egyptian handmaiden. And what does the word of God tell us? And the angel of the Lord found her. Man, what a profound truth that is. The same words that were said to Zacchaeus in Luke chapter 19 when Jesus says that I came to seek and to save that which was lost. Jesus' first sermon in the gospel of Luke chapter 4 was he came to do what? To heal the brokenhearted. To liberate the captives. This is who and what he's about. And he sees this woman in her, in her despair as she's been abandoned by the two most important people in her life. And I love what is said about 
the angel of the Lord in the text, he found her. And he's seeking and he's desiring to save that which is lost. Jesus steps into her life at a critical point in a critical place. And you know what that place is? The way of sure. The way of sure is this huge, those of you that were in Israel with us last fall, you know that in Israel there are these things called wadis. A wadi is a huge dry arroyo or a massive canyon. And the way of sure is one of those large canyons just before you cross into the Egyptian part. It's in the Sinai. And that's where Jesus finds this woman. You know what the word sure means? You know what the way of sure is in her life? The sure means wall. She was completely walled in. In her mind, there was no escape or no escaping her situation and her circumstances. She found herself in a wall or at a wall. And guess who shows up? Jesus Christ. Encouraged by God's presence. Hagar, bless her heart, had her back against the wall. And Jesus shows up and meets at a fountain. Does that ring a bell? Does that story ring a bell with anybody? Where else does that occur in Scripture? John chapter 4. And you know who else he met up with in that, in that text? A Samaritan woman. I'll never forget that story or the whole story of Jacob's well. Why is that? Because Larry Sosha left a huge mark on that place last, last fall. You guys remember that? Remember Larry? <laughs> Walking in to go look at the well. And Larry gashes his head on the doorway. <laughs> How many stitches? 42. <laughs> Those places are literal places where God met with key individuals in history to shed light, to give hope to bring perspective to his life. This is why we need to be encouraged and embrace these encounters and his presence in our lives. And Jesus shows up in her life and later on some 4,000 years later in the life of the Samaritan woman, 2,000 years later, and reveals to him and reveals to her that he is that living water where she would and will not thirst no more. Now listen to what verse number eight says. This is an interesting thing that Jesus asks her two questions. In verse eight, he asks these questions and he said to Hagar, Sarai's maid, whence camest thou and whither wilt thou go? Where are you coming from and where are you going? It's a question that every one of us have been asked spiritually and some point in our lives where you been you know what i love about that question and god wants to know your story he wants to know what you've been through he wants to know what you're about your experience your life your challenges the things that have brought you to the place of despair or affliction and then he asks where are you going? Where will you go, Hagar? Question that he asks of us even to this day. Where will we you go as God continues to open doors and reveal to us this incredible journey, this incredible life, this abundant life that he's promised us? Where will you go is the question. I'm reminded of that story in John chapter number six when Jesus was laying out to his disciples the fact that he is the bread of life. Remember that story? And he began to impart and share some really deep and profound 
things to those followers that were a part of his ministry. And it says in the Gospel of John, chapter 6, verse, listen to this, 66, that as some of those disciples heard some of those truths, they said, man, this is some heavy stuff. I'm not sure that we can, or I'm not going to be able to follow you anymore, Lord. And the Bible says that from that point on, several of his disciples followed him no more. And then he looked to his disciples, to the 12, to Peter specifically, and he says, are you guys going to go too? Are you guys going to leave? And I love Peter's response. Lord, where are we going to go? For you hold the words of life. He holds the words of life. He holds anything and everything that we get through in this, that we need in this life to become the victors that he's called us to be. And he asked Hagar the very same question that he asks you and me each and every day. Where will you go? What are you going to do with this life, this one life that I've given you in this journey, in your story? For ye are God's workmanship, the Bible says. Ye are God's. You were created by him and you were created for him. And Jesus, just like he does with the disciples and just like he did with the Saron, he's constantly probing, wanting and knowing where we will go. Look at verse number eight. And he said, Hagar, Sarai's maid, whence camest thou? And whither wilt thou go? And she said, I flee from the face of my mistress, Sarah. Here's my dilemma. Here's my challenge. And look what he tells her to do next. Is this not crazy or what? Look at verse 9. And the angel of the Lord said unto her, Return to thy mistress and submit thyself under her handle. Wow. Tell me that wasn't a hard deal. A difficult situation to contend with. You know what Jesus just told us, woman? Quit sweeping your problems under the rug. Quit running away from your Situations. You know what he just did? He sent her to the only place and the only two people that knew anything about the God of Israel. Abraham and Sarah. I know there aren't any perfect families, right? There might be a couple in this room. When I look at Dennis and Bobby, perfect family. We used to be the perfect church until you walked in the doors. <laughs> until, I might, until I made my way in this building. This was a perfect place. There's no perfection. This thing is flawed. And why is the body of Christ flawed? Because we're flawed. Because of the human condition. Because of human nature. And man, he's telling her to go back to the only place that could provide her a covering and to teach her about the things of the Lord. And after she goes back and things are going to be okay for a little while, but when you get to chapter number 21, things get really ugly. Go back and read the entire story after Isaac is born. But nonetheless, I would encourage you and I would challenge you to never leave the place of covering that God has for you in terms of revealing to you and to me God's plan and God's purpose for your life. In spite of how dysfunctional we can be and how dysfunctional we are, come back. Come back. Let us work through whatever it is that we need to work through together, but at the end of the day, this thing is not about you. It's not about me. It's about him. Thank you, Jack, for the text that you read this morning at prayer. 
out of the book of Psalms, chapter 24, where David cries out, Lift up your head, O ye gates, and the King of glory shall come in. Who is the King of glory? The Lord Almighty. He is the King of glory. He's why we're here. He's why we exist. And anything and everything that we go through in this world and in this life, the despair and the affliction and all the things that we struggle with are so that God could use them in our lives to, so that he can draw us closer to him. Talk about a life of affliction. Look at verse number 10 now. I love these verses. Let's start looking and, and unpacking some of these, these promises these, that God makes to her. And the angel of the Lord said unto her, I will no- multiply thy seed exceedingly, that it shall not be numbered for the multitude. And the angel of the Lord said unto her, Behold, thou art with child, and, sh- and shall bear a son, and shall call his name Ishmael, because the Lord hath heard the what? He's heard your what? Your affliction. Listen, folks, he knows what you're going through. Don't lose sight of that. That word, that name, Ishmael, there's a reason why God puts certain words and names and phrases in his, in his word, in his book. That name, Ishmael, means God will hear. Isn't that cool? God will hear. He'll hear you in that, in that day, that time of your affliction. I love what David wrote in the 119th chapter, the 72nd verse of the Psalms when he says, it is good, he says, for me to be afflicted. Why? That I might learn thy statutes. God found her and he spoke to her at a difficult, challenging, chaotic time in her life. And he says to her, God will hear you. God hears her in her affliction. Look at verse number 13. You know what else God does? Look at verse 13. And she called the name of the Lord that spake unto her, Thou God seest me. Thou God seest me, for she said, Have I also here looked after him that seeth me? Not only God, not only does God find you, not only God does God hear you, but he also sees what you're going through. This is the God of the Bible. This is the God that wants nothing more than to have an intimate personal relationship with you. He's looking and he's seeking and he wants to find you so that you can hear from him. And ultimately, as he'll look down on you, he'll see and he'll be able to totally grasp what you're going and, and, and going through. In the, the Gospel of Matthew, chapter number nine, as Jesus was looking on the multitude, the Bible says that he saw the multitude and he was what? He was moved with compassion. Listen, single mom, single dad, he knows what you're dealing with. He knows what you're going through. In spite of the fact that all these people in your life have left you, have abandoned you, his presence will encourage you. His promises need and could and should be embraced Look what it says here in verse 14. And wherefore, the well was called. Everybody, you want to get this? Can anybody quote this for me? Beher la You know what that means? This is really cool. The well of the living one seeing you. Isn't God good? He finds He hears and he sees. And we know from history and we know from current events that this promise made in this chapter is coming to fruition. Right now, as we speak, while America is finding itself 
finding itself fighting with each other over politics and this and that and everything else. And we're looking and focusing internally and all that is broken and all that is wrong. We're totally losing sight of who and what God is doing in this planet. Did you know, folks, that some of the greatest revivals right now are happening in the Arab world? More, more Persians, more Iranians are coming to Christ each and every day than Americans are coming to Christ. While we sit around and we play church and we fight about this or that or look inwardly and look at just all that is wrong and is God is working, God is moving in the world of Ishmael like never before. His promises are true. His promises are playing out even as we speak today. Let me share with you one last thought. You find these verses in the book of Isaiah, chapter 19, verses 19 through 22. Context, the second coming of Christ. How many of you in this room this morning believe that his return is nigh, that his coming is nigh? We're there, folks, like never before. Listen to the words of Isaiah about the Egyptian people, about he, how he's going to keep his promise, a promise made way back here in Genesis chapter number 16. As a matter of fact, before you turn to Isaiah 19, let's finish up with a couple thoughts in Genesis 16, we didn't really cover one or two of these verses because look what is said of Ishmael after God hears Hagar's affliction. Verse 12, it says this, and he, speaking of Ishmael, and he will be a wild man. Wow, didn't that come true? And he will be a wild man, and his hand will be against every man, and every man's hand against him. And he shall dwell in the presence of all his brethren man isn't god's word true right remember isis just a few years ago guess who they were descendants of ishmael wild men wild man to this day a hatred for the jewish people until the day comes where the king of glory will reveal himself to them. Isaiah 19. Listen closely to these words. In that day, in that day, shall there be an altar to the Lord in the midst of the land of Egypt and a pillar at the border thereof to the Lord. And it shall be for a sign and for a witness unto the Lord of hosts in the land of Egypt. For they shall cry unto the Lord because of the oppressors and he shall send them a savior and a great one and he shall deliver them. Who is Isaiah writing about? The Egyptians. Listen to verse number 21. And the Lord shall be known to Egypt and the Egyptians shall know the Lord in that day. And shall do sacrifice and oblation. Yea, they shall vow a vow unto the Lord and perform it. Verse 22. And the Lord shall smite Egypt. He shall smite and heal it. And they shall return even to the Lord. And he shall be entreated of them. And shall heal them. Wow. Who is the king of glory? The Lord Almighty, He is the King of glory. We're all in this together. Single parent, feeling alone, feeling abandoned. Come back to Abraham and Sarah. Let Him minister through the body of Christ as dysfunctional as she is. Let him heal you through this journey together.
and together we will prepare for his return. Let's pray. Lord, we thank you for your word. We thank you for this story that is so profound, Lord Jesus, and so incredible, Lord, not just doctrinally as we consider the, the pictures and the theology and the history and the prophecy around it, Lord Jesus, but in it we find truths, Lord, promises. Lord, that you're out looking to seek and to save. That, Lord Jesus, that you're availing yourself and allowing yourself to be heard. And, Lord, that you hear us in our affliction. And I thank you, Lord Jesus, for being that gracious and that merciful with your creation. And Lord, I thank you and I'm so grateful for the fact that even now, Lord Jesus, you're looking down and you see us. You see exactly who we are and what we're dealing with. And I do, Lord, and I pray for all the single parents in this room, in this town, Lord, in this world, the Lord Jesus, you would reveal yourself to them. That you would find them. That you would seek and save those that are out there, Lord Jesus, crying and praying in their affliction. Thank you, Lord, for your grace, your mercy, your promises. Lord Jesus, your love for us. In Jesus' precious name, Lord, we ask these things.